All righty. So again, I'm Gunnar. Um, I'm from the University of Glasgow, although I'm from Minnesota in the US, so I do not sound very Glaswegian. Um, thanks again to the exclamation team for hosting this conference. Um, and again, it is the ruin of this land uh, will unquiet her ghost, pastoralism and Mary Butts's death of Felicity Turner. So near the end of the 1920s, economic expansion within England began to press further into rural areas. What were once quaint localized villages became hotspots for development, especially within the tourism industry. <clears throat> During her lifetime, modernist writer Mary Butts witnessed these changes firsthand. Butts documented these changes in her essays and journals and weaved them into the plots of her novels. As Nathalie Blondell writes in her introduction to a collection of Butts published journals, quote, her lifetime unfolded within and was an expression of modernity where everything was in constant flux and increased motion, was noisier and brighter. By the time of her death in 1937, again in a rural setting, her house was lit by electricity. So this paper examines how Butts uses the automobile, a common motif of modernity, to showcase the changing relationship between urban and rural landscapes. By tying this image into what Terry Gifford defines as the pastoral, quote, literature that describes the country is providing an implicit or explicit contrast to the urban in his 1999 book, Pastoral, we can evaluate what role the motor car played in both the upkeep and blurring of the distinction between urban and rural spaces. While the car provided an explicit bridge between the two spheres, carrying tourists to remote cliffsides and natural wonders, it also contributed to the erasure of the boundary between the two by making artifacts of modernity a permanent fixture of the landscape. Butts writes of motorists in her essay to Land's End that, quote, well, in their hurry to arrive and depart, they have made life in Senon Church Town, the last village in England, about as safe as in Piccadilly Circus, without benefit of men on point duty or traffic lights. These themes of modernity, urbanization, and a more general vanishing of the rural are present throughout many of her writings, but most no notably in her 1932 novel, Death of Felicity Taverner. The novel centers on the grieving Taverner family caught in a gridlock over the future of Felicity's estate after she dies abroad in a tragic motor car accident. Her death also represents the encroachment of industry and tourism on their larger Dorset community. Each of the family members has their own beliefs on what should happen to and who should inherit the estate, but they all differ in their approaches and motivations behind their attempt to honor Felicity's memory and by extension, the land it sits on. This paper will also explore how the pastoral itself is upheld via the patriarchy, particularly as the land is linked to paternity and inheritance. By closely reading the text through the, fam the framework of Gloria Anzal Dow's essay, Bridge, Drawbridge, Sandbar, or Island, we can see how the Taverner women struggle to navigate the difficulty of preserving their land while also trying to retain a degree of, a degree of independence as women. And using an eco-feminist lens to unite the motif of the automobile with pastoralism and the varying approaches to preservation, the advantages and disadvantages of the motor car providing an easier, faster, and more accessible route to the rural landscape can be evaluated. And I would like to say that this is part of a larger dissertation I'm working on that explores the literary representations of these collisions uh, when the progress imbued within the automobile clashes with the natural landscape and people, both made victims beneath its tread. So the pastoral, since the time of the Greeks, has given a literary form to people's immersion into nature. Although often evoking the quintessential image of a shepherd lazily watching over their flock of sheep, the term has evolved to encompass a much larger field. According to Terry Gifford, the pastoral is an ancient cultural tool. It has been a major way in which we, in Western culture, have mediated and negotiated our relationship with the land upon which we depend and the forces of nature at work out there in outer nature, as we have at the same time mediated and negotiated our relationship with each other and what we think of as our inner nature. The pastoral therefore provides a form that bridges our internal selves with the outer world, not unlike how the automobile provides a bridge between the urban centers and rural pockets. In Death of Felicity Taverner, these two bridges intersect, and the pastoral as a form is both challenged and modernized with the introduction of the motor car and the vaster modernity it represents. 
The evocation of Gifford's pastoral, one which again describes the countries providing an implicit or explicit contrast to the urban, is best, re best realized in Felicity's death caused by an automobile accident. Although her death precedes the beginning of the novel and the circumstances around her death are unclear, its gruesome image is immediately brought to the reader's attention. Scylla did not know if it had been suicide, which had left Felicity bloody and dusty beside the road under a rock. Now, Felicity's death is not the first modernist example of this sort of gruesome, bloody, grotesque death caused by artifacts of modernity. Um, if anybody's familiar with E.M. Forster, I think one of the best examples is Ricky in The Longest Journey, who has his legs chopped off by a train. So. In the wake of Felicity's death, the remaining Taverners gather at their homes in Dorset to discuss the future of Felicity's estate. Her ancestral home is technically willed to her brother, Adrian, but it's been let to her widower, Kralin, a Slavic Jew. Kralin then makes it known to the Taverners that it's his intention to purpose the property from them. This intention raises doubts for Felicity's cousins, Scylla and Felix, their neighbor, Picus, and their guest, Boris. The group then makes it their mission to protect the home from falling into the wrong hands. Wrong hands to Scylla appears to mean anyone who intends to ruin, commodify, or commercialize the land by developing it. But her opinions are also characterized by heavy xenophobic overtones. Scylla, upon her first visit to meet Kralin at Felicity's house, is immediately met by, quote, the least the kind least tolerated of strangers in the land, out of town by rapid transit from its slums. Young, heavy haunched and overbreasted, wearing a terrible parody of country clothes. This image and characterization of, quote, strangers in the land is a common in image conjured up by Butts, writing in her essay, Vandal Visitors to the West, that, quote, before the invention of the cheap car, a few real foreigners came regularly winter and summer to stay or live here, artists and writers and quiet gentry, but all were gently bred and amiably tolerant, people who knew their place. This image of a right and wrong visitor resists the peaceful and idyllic qualities of the pastoral and instead reflects the xenophobia and snobbishness of policing who deserves to visit these rural areas. The image of Kralin is then expanded upon, noting that he is straddled by women on each side and coolly mentions them having motored over. This is a stark contrast to the lengthy and eventful hill walk that Scylla takes on her way to the house. With Crawlin's arrival via the motor car, the scene is set for encroaching modernity to further divide the taverners from their ill-suited visitors. The conflict between Crawlin and the taverners intensifies as it's revealed that not, he intends not only on just purchasing the house, but also much of the land that abuts it. Crawlin's ultimate goal emerges as a plan to amass a vast collection of real estate in the area and develop it as a mecca for tourists. The Taverners, steadfast in their plan to preserve the land, object. Crawlin goes on to explain that the temptation is too much. You people talk about high poverty and taxation when you've got a gold mine above your ground, not under it. This type of development coincides with the boom in tourism generated by the popularity of the motor car, as Enda Duffy writes in a 2009 book, The Speed Handbook that with the motor car, quote, the modern notion of tourism is travel devoted to the nostalgic search for sites that retain a residue of their sense of place had become wildly popular. This feeds further into the irony noticed firsthand by Butts, writing of the popular English destination Land's End. She says, being what it is for four months of the year and most weekends, a stream of motors afflict it and without the least danger to life or limb, make it a camping ground for people with an itch to take their cars somewhere and the insulted earth makes no protest at their litter, at the delicate underfoot loveliness they destroy, destroy without visible enjoyment for all they do is stand and stare, complain a little, explore nowhere. In this case, Butz's critique follows a less xenophobic philosophy and instead criticizes the motivations and actions of those visiting the countryside. The mass tourism increased traffic to these remote areas are at the same time detracting from their appeal as quote, places that retain the residue of their sense of place. As more and more visitors visit, the land becomes increasingly destroyed. Similarly, the Taverners despise Carlin's plans for the land as they feel that an increase in tourists would detract from the serenity and integrity of an area where centuries ago their house had been built in the most ancient part of the wood within sound of the sea. The motor car opened up these ancient woods to casual passers-by and turned their sacred homeland into a revolving door of tourists with little regard for the impact they left on the landscape or community. 
The Traverna women can be used as a case study to examine the principles put forth by Gloria Anseldawa in her essay, Bridge, Drawbridge, Sandbar, or Island, which analyzes the familial and divisive relationships between a group, group of activists. By focusing on Scylla and Mrs. Taverna, Felicity's mom, we can see how the women united in their desire for preservation of the land are also operating with vastly different assumptions, expectations, and alliances. However, both of these women are singular in their want to preserve the landscape, an embodiment of the martyred Felicity, and stand against the progress imbued by Crawlin and his deadly motor car. While both feel a certain sense of pride and catharsis in fighting for Felicity's memory, those in an alliance group also feel like a family and squabble and fight like one, complete with a favorite, good child, and scapegoat, bad child. In this case, Scylla is framed as more of the good child, with her motives being tied to her innocence, although often also her naivety. Um, Mrs. Taverner is more so the bad child, with her motivations relating to control and an inability to give others autonomy. In either case, the bickering and conflict within the Alliance group nearly causes a tear wide enough for Crawlin to succeed in his attempt to develop the land. Mrs. Taverner is a staunch pr preservationist, but only because she refuses to relinquish control over the land to someone else. Rather than acting pr to preserve the landscape for its own sake, Mrs. Taverner uses preservation as a tool to propagate another definition of the pastoral that Gifford defines, which is a false ideology that served to endorse a comfortable status quo for the landowning class. It's this desire to control that largely separates Scylla from Mrs. Taverner and informs their approaches to preservation. Mrs. Taverner's truest intentions are best showcased in her attitude toward Felicity herself, who in her death becomes embodied in the landscape. Just as Mrs. Taverner sought to control Felicity during her lifetime, so too does she desire to control the fate of the countryside. When speaking of Felicity to Adrian, her son and Felicity's brother, she reveals this, saying that she prefers things natural, but tame. You wanted it artificial, like the silk flowers they sell in shops. No, said his mother in her rare lowered voice, only not wild. Here we can see that Mrs. Taverner draws a distinction between natural and wild, the former being something she can still own and possess, but, the la but not the latter, which represents a dilution of her control. Her zeal for the land, although rooted in control, is, in, is, is indeed genuine. Her advocacy as a preservationist in the region is well noted and even annoys many of the locals. More than one valiant cliff she had kept unbuilt on because of her a many stream ran pure, many a copse endured. Not through her did the public house lose its license. The wicked old woman did not feel well bred, not in that way. Let them walk if their cars won't take them, had been her last word when the extension of road facilities had been up before the county council, on which she sat, a scrooge to its members who had surveyor and architects beneath her feet. Here again, we can see the recurring image of the car and that in limiting its access, it's a synonymous with preservation. Removed from the urban centers, the image of the motor car was one where locals saw one raise the dust on a village street for whom 25 miles an hour was intensely fast. Having the privilege of living in both city and Dorset, Mrs. Taverner is familiar enough to resist the thrill of the automobile and recognize its power to transform an area. However, while trying her best to uh, to hold her own in local politics. Mrs. Taverner is still at the whim of strict inheritance laws that favor males. Adrian, the rightful heir to Felicity's house, is quiet but assertive in his claim to the estate. On multiple occasions, he repeats that even though Mrs. Taverner is steering the ne negotiations over the land, it is he that actually owns it. When initial negotiations with Carl and Sauer, Mrs. Taverner speaks about the house as if it is her own, while Adrian str struggles to make his position known. My house, said Adrian Taverner softly and tried to catch Crawlin's eye. This struggle for control continues as Adrian's paternity is called into question and the fate of the estate becomes even more muddled. Though all differ in their motives and actions towards preservation, the two women both have to plan around the laws of inheritance that ultimately govern ownership of the land. As the automobile grew in popularity and spurred a wave of domestic tourism to small rural towns, the locals were forced to reckon with the economic opportunity of playing host or instead employing preservationist attitudes, which also often fostered xenophobic feelings. Death of Felicity Turner explores these themes, allowing each of the characters to embody a different viewpoint within their familial alliance. When factoring in journal entries and essays published by Butts herself, we can see how the automobile, while providing a vital link between the urban and rural, also blurred the distinctions between the two. 
the pastoral as a form was also muddled by the lack of a clear distinction between the two spheres and was challenged by its reliance on the patriarchy via paternity and inheritance. In a world that's barreling further and further towards irreversible climate catastrophe, I think it's important to look back at our earliest relationships with goods that largely rely on fossil fuels. The motor car, which has only been around for a little over a century, has be so become such a quotidian part of the human experience that it's hard to imagine a world without it. However, as Butts emphasized, its prowess as a machine of freedom, prestige, and even sex appeal is undercut by its potential to kill both landscapes and people. It's my hope that we can learn from these modernist representations of cars to reflect on our present relationship with them and steer towards a future that balances the accessibility, convenience of free and freedom of the automobile with its adverse impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. Um